So I saw many of you, I, let's hope all of you submitted the, um, the midterm thingy. So we will go over some of them today and some of them in the uh, remaining class. I will ask you for what your preferences are before going back, but I also want to cover some new material um, before we do that. So, yeah, so we are nearly at the end of this semester and it's been a crazy semester. I would have liked to talk about more things, but uh, we want, there is a new homework, homework five, you guys got it, right? Okay. The final exam will also be reading a paper. It won't have a presentation. You will be submitting a report. There will be two papers. There will be two sets of papers. Set A will have a bit more involved rigorous paper and set B will have a bit more on the lighter side, I would, I would call it. So there will be two sets of paper and I will release them uh, day after tomorrow. You will have enough time. They will be, the reports will be due around 15th May or whenever and there won't be any more homework. So I'm not going to do a traditional exam, but I will be grading you over that final. Okay. So <clears throat> today we are going to talk about broken symmetry and order parameters. So we will be talking about broken symmetry and a bit more about order parameters. So what does that mean? What that means is, So we, we will think of a very simple, I, I will try to confuse you with a simple conundrum and then we will try to see how to solve that confusion, what's, what's really going on there. So let's consider an Ising model. Let's consider an Ising model in 1D, 2D, 3D, whichever dimension you want with some interaction energy E nu which is a function of the various spin states, S1, S2, S3. So this, these spins themselves, huh? these spins themselves could be arranged in 1D, 2D, 3D, doesn't matter. So the problem we are looking at is in the absence of an external magnetic field. So we say that there is a constant interaction J. J itself could be first neighbors, second neighbors, all neighbors, or whatever it is, SI multiplied by SJ. So there is no external magnetic field. So for this, let's write down the formula for the average magnetization. What would that be? Like anything else, the average of any thermodynamic quantity is given by going to every microstate, looking at the value of that quantity in that microstate, multiplying by the probability of that microstate, right? This is something you should all be very comfortable with now because that's the key thing in this semester. How do we do that? That itself is given by one over Q, the partition function m nu in any state e to the power minus beta e nu we, we are working in the canonical partition function and e nu here comes from formula one so let's use one into along with definition of m nu what is definition of m nu m nu in a given microstate is going over every spin and summing it up, SI, that's a mu multiplied by mu, which is your unit for every magnetic uh, little, the strength of every little magnet that it could maximally have. So, and we are interested in a model where SI for any I could be plus minus one. So if you, all of them are, all of them are plus one, then the magnetization would be N multiplied by mu. If all of them are minus one, the magnetization will be minus mu they could all be antiferromagnetic, plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, then the magnetization would be zero. So, and we don't worry about an odd number of spins or even number of spins because N is so large that it really doesn't matter. So given this, we can now write average M as one over Q summation mu I is equal to one to N mu si e to the power minus beta e nu. So now let's consider something. The e nu of a configuration s1, s2, dot, 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 
and the enu for a configuration minus s1 minus s2 minus s3 dot 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 what can we say about these two energies relative to each other will they be same or will they be different given equation one they will be same right because all you have is minus j sifj was the energy and now what you have done is to say my, instead of minus j i have minus si and minus sj right so there is no difference so these two are the same so what this means is if you go and look at this equation over here the probability of finding a configuration that looks like s1 s2 s3 is the same as the probability of finding a configuration that looks like minus s1 minus s2 minus s3 so every configuration with positive magnetization m nu let's say it's positive some mu si will have a corresponding configuration with negative magnetization m nu is equal to minus mu i should write it as m nu is equal to mu minus si with equal probability with exactly equal probability how do we know that because we saw that e nu is symmetric if you change all signs at the same time e nu does not change and if e nu does not change then the probability e to the power minus beta e nu changes now you could imagine if you were working in a grand canonical scenario where the chemical potential for the plus spins were different from the chemical potential for the negative spin then this won't be true or if you had an external magnetic field if you had a plus h over here then also it won't be true right because if you just simply spin the flip the spins this term would not be symmetric that would not be the same so in the absence of an external magnetic field every configuration s1 s2 s3 is as likely to be seen as a configuration minus s1 minus s2 minus s3 what does this tell about the average magnetization then that we expect on this basis that a given spin configuration s1 s2 s3 is as likely as a spin configuration minus s1 minus s2 minus s3 just based on this information what can you say about the net magnetization how much should it be zero zero who said that is that ben no who is it kevin so why is that so kevin well if it's equally likely to be for that would mean that for every uh one where they're spinning up there's yeah. an equally likely configuration where they're spinning down so when you sum over all of them they're just going to cancel each other so yeah and do you see a problem with this statement how would we get the spontaneous magnetization then i guess precisely this this is a conundrum right i mean you can maybe say that in 1d our life is okay because as soon so in 1d this is maybe okay thanks kevin so in 1d maybe okay because as soon as temperature is equal to epsilon for any epsilon more than zero howsoever small we know that magnetization goes to zero but in 2d and 3d this is not true in 2d and 3d we know that m can be non-zero for finite t that can be observed in a laboratory setup or whatever you want so what's going on here this is what we want to understand what's the problem and even in 1d if you think about it for zero temperature we do have a problem so how to deal with this so it's it's not a big mystery and you will see what really goes on here and the answer is essentially the system becomes non ergodic you get trapped in one state so in order to look at this carefully so to solve this problem to solve this issue we will look let's consider that our system is prepared by so first thing you have to uh, so we are we are now imagining an actual experiment so let's consider that our system is prepared by application of an external magnetic field so if you have an external magnetic field h 
it could be positive, it could be negative, but it lifts this degeneracy. So currently what we saw is that the system is degenerate. Positive spins are as likely as negative spins. This degeneracy is now uh, lifted if you apply an external magnetic field. Then imagine that the field is gradually removed. and brought to zero. So, but let's say that our initial magnetic field was positive, okay? We could, we could do the same experiment with it being negative, but let's say it was positive. And now we bring it to zero from the positive side. So it's always a positive number, but it tends to zero from the positive side. So, <clears throat> so you can imagine that in this case, if H was very, very positive, the system would like to stay preferentially in the positive spin side, right? Because now this Hamiltonian is no longer true. The true Hamiltonian is always plus H, uh, sorry, minus, uh, minus H multiplied by summation of SI, but we had set H is equal to zero, so that's why that was gone. But now we have an external H, so it will force the system to be like that. So in order to see what goes on here, we are going to introduce a bit of terminology. It's not very, complicated, it might look a bit strange. We will consider the partition function of this system. So, so far we have considered the partition function Q, which is summation over all e to the power minus beta in u. What we will consider now is a restricted partition function. So what, what is really a partition function? Once you have finished the semester, you will think about this partition function and it's really summing over all probabilities that you can have, right, to normalize it. So now we introduce a restricted partition function, we call it Q tilde, and it's restricted as per values of magnetization. So what we do here is go to every microstate and count e to the power minus beta e nu. If we had written one over here, then it would just be the partition function, right? If we had just one over here, then it would be partition function. Here what we do is to introduce an indicator function, like a switch, of which we call m minus m delta, where delta is equal to one if m nu is equal to m and delta is equal to zero if m nu not equal to m. So you can see what this is doing. It's counting the partition function, but restricting itself to the states where you have a certain given magnetization. This magnetization could very well be zero. So here m could be zero or m could be mu n by eight, it could be any value that you want, some magnetization. Given this, what's the connection between Q and Q tilde m? Do you guys see, guys and ladies, that what's the connection between Q and Q tilde m? How would I get Q from Q tilde m? What would happen if I summed up Q tilde M for all values of M? We get Q. We would get Q, is that obvious to everyone? Just think about it because when you are summing this over a microstate, you have to have a certain magnetization. All that's, you have taken the partition function and separated it into different parts coming from different magnetizations. And if you take all those parts and sum it over, you regenerate, the original, uh, original partition function. With this now, we can talk about the probability of observing the system in a given magnetization. So the probability of observing the system with magnetization M, this is something we wrote earlier. Well, we wrote the this is a bit different from what we wrote earlier. Earlier, we talked about the average magnetization. Now we are talking about the probability of observing a given magnetization will be simply Q tilde M divided by Q, right? So what is, I will write down the full thing. So this is summation over all microstate. Count if the magnetization in that microstate is equal to M e to the power minus theta A nu. Uh, one quick question. Yeah. Can we go back one page? So at least the way this is written down here, he said delta is one if m nu is m. 
wouldn't that still be zero? Because m minus m nu would be zero times one is zero. So it's more oh, like a delta. Oh, oh, sorry. This is not multiplication. This is a function of. Okay, it's a delta function. Okay. This is function. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Delta is a function of n minus m nu. It's yeah. not multiplied. You're right. That would be crap. So does everyone see this formula? This is really. I mean, we could have written down this formula here without introducing q bar and q. It's really counting states and weighting them by their probability. But now we have introduced this. The reason why we introduced this is because if you look at minus kbt times log of q tilde m, this is something we have seen in the past. If we are going to call it a tilde of m, and we define a tilde of m as minus kt log of q tilde m. This is the potential of mean force of magnetization. In other words, a tilde m1 minus a tilde m2 gives the reversible work needed to change magnetization from M1 to M2. So this is quite a nice concept and it's a bit, bit strange maybe at this point, but if you think about it, it's not complicated. You have already dealt with potential of mean force in, in, in terms of moving particles from infinity to R or a certain distance R2 to R1. Now, instead of moving particles, you are thinking in an abstract space where you are moving the magnetization from some value M1 to M2. So this gives you an estimate of the reversible work done. And it's a nice formula because the summation in this Q tilde is happening over all microstates. This is taking into account all the states of the system. So you remember why was potential of mean force hard to calculate? Potential of mean force was hard to calculate because as you move two particles close or separate, you have to take into account how does the environment over here move, right? That, that's what makes it hard. So over here also, these could be spins and you are turning down these spins from some value plus one to minus one. You are really taking into account how everything in the system is changing. Here, it's a bit different. You're not talking about two spins at the same time. The property that you're observing is the net magnetization of the system. So now let's plot this A tilde M how it will look like as a function of m. And that will help us answer our question. So a tilde m, and I will just draw it, and if you think through it, you will see intuitively why it's correct, will tend to look something like, and I'm over, uh, actually, one thing I want to check is, one more. So if our external magnetic field is, so one thing to remember is we started our original experiment by preparing the system in H more than zero. And our Hamiltonian is such that this means average magnetization will be negative because our original Hamiltonian, our original energy function has E nu is equal to minus j si fj minus h si, right? So h, if h is positive, then si type tries to try to be negative. So here I'm leaving a little gap above the zero and I will explain what that is. So <clears throat> this will look something like this. This over here corresponds to some very negative value, this corresponds to some very positive value. In reality, it should not peak on the other side. In reality, it should have a sharp stop, but we are, we are going to ignore that part. It, it will have a shape, shape like this. In fact, let's see what Chandler draws it out. So, phase transitions. Yeah, so Chandler also draws this as it like, this, you can see this, this curve over here draws sharp, rises up very quickly. If you can see my screen. So this should be infinitely quickly in any system. For what we are studying, this should be basically a sharp delta wall. 
in my drawing i have drawn it smoothly but that's what it is so <clears throat> this is when the magnetization moment is negative this is when the magnetization moment uh, the magnetization is positive and this quantity over here the barrier to go from negative magnetization to positive magnetization we call it as e star and this little thing over here we call as delta e so <clears throat> First of all, apart if you ignore delta E, so if H was zero, if external magnetic field was zero, then delta E would be equal to zero, right? And this curve would be symmetric. That's not surprising. That's just expressing that thing we did at the beginning of this class, that in the absence of ex external magnetic field, the probabilities are symmetric. There is no difference. Now you have a slight asymmetry and uh, the thing that is of most interest to us here is E star. What can we say about E star as a function of dimension? What happens to E star in 1D? Actually, I should write it like this. So what can we say about E star as a function of dimension? So in 1D, Given the arguments you have seen so far, what do you think E star would be? In 1D, E star is zero. There is no cost for going all the way from A to B. You can create any magnetization. You can directly as n tends to infinity. That's the most important thing. Why? Because in 1D, the entropy always wins, right? The cost for creating an interface is always so dominant that energetically there is no difference you can always flip so in 1d e star is zero in 2d e star goes as n to the power one by two in 3d e star goes as n to the power two by three so this is just the surface area that i'm talking about and, and now you can see what's the problem in why do we get this conundrum it's kinetics it's all about kinetics it's all about non-ergodicity you could prepare for so delta E means delta E is a parameter which basically I mean Chandler introduces this that's why I drew it over here it doesn't really matter much for the sake of this uh, argument you prepare the system in some external magnetic field and then you bring it down as you bring it down delta E goes to zero but you will get trapped in one of these ones so if you started in a negative magnetic field you will get trapped over here as you brought the magnetic field down to zero, the external magnetic field. So this state over here, where all spins are pointing up, has an equally likely probability. It's also the minimum in the energy. So in principle, you could be able to jump from here to here, but the barrier is so high that you cannot make that jump. If you were in 1D, you would make that jump at any finite temperature. In 1D, it's not that the barrier is zero. Here we are talking about tens to. The barrier tends to zero. So as soon as you have the slightest temperature, you have enough energy to hop over the barrier and go to the other side. In 2D, you can see what happens in thermodynamic limit. Thermodynamic limit means n tends to infinity. So as n tends to infinity, the barrier also tends to infinity really fast. In 3D, the barrier tends to infinity even faster. And you get trapped wherever you are. This is a classic example of non-ergodic behavior. If you waited and waited and waited much longer than the age of the universe, you would have a thermal fluctuation, which would take you from this side to this side. And this thing that we wrote down that average M is equal to zero would still be true. But it is this kinetic barrier that stops us from getting to the other side and we get trapped in one state. So this is what is called broken symmetry. By introducing this non-ergodic behavior, you have forced the system to be trapped in a broken symmetry state. So E star will be much, much bigger than KT in 2D and 3D. Trapping the system
in a broken symmetry state. making it less and less ergodic. Now, this is a really simple model system for those of you who are, I hope all of you are enjoying the class, but uh, yeah, so let's say for all of you who are, all of you, since you're enjoying this class, you should go back and think about this. The, the, the ramifications of this in society, right? If you're trying to model society as a rich person being spin up and a poor person being spin down, Right? And you can say and use your arguments in free market, everything will equal bear and everything will be balanced out, but there could be kinetic barriers and you might get trapped in one state. So one of the papers I'm going to give you for reading for the final exam uses this broken symmetry idea to model the stock market and talks about phase transitions in the stock market. It introduces phase diagram of water and then tries to draw parallel with a phase diagram of a stock market and say how you might get trapped in one state and you can, you, know, you can draw lots and lots of parallels. So this broken symmetry idea is extremely powerful in a variety of things. So, and the other point, so that's our notion of broken symmetry. And really, I mean, we could be spending a whole semester talking about these things as to how does broken symmetry happen? What's really going on? We don't have that much time. One thing I want to mention now is the notion of an order parameter. It's really fundamental in chemistry, physics, and biology. So here, our order, order parameter is the magnetization M, the fluctuating magnetization M is an order parameter for the Ising model. And essentially it is defined as a fluctuating variable whose average value provides a signature of order in the system. So if the average value of M is zero, it could be antiferromagnetic, it could still be ordered, but typically average value of M is equal to zero means there is chaos in the system, plus and minus, and I use the word chaos lightly here, plus and minus both are equally likely and there is no order. So a fluctuating variable whose Average value provides a signature of order in the system. So these order parameters show up in variety of cases and different problems have different order parameters. And uh, for Ising model, the magnetization is an order parameter. So <clears throat> a related concept, so to this, which is also quite interesting is the range of correlations. So when a system is truly ordered, you ex you, it almost as it looks that the spin over here is kind of talking to the spin way out in the distance. If this one is plus, in an ordered system, if you observe one spin to be equal to plus, and I ask you what is the value of another spin, a hundred kilometers away from the first spin, you can say it is one. It is also plus, right? You don't have to do the experiment. You know the system is ordered. So let me draw it over in a diagram. So let's say I, I break this into spins like this, and I talk about some spin A and some spin B, which is very far from each other. And I tell you that the magnetization of the system m is equal to mu n right it's positive the system is completely ordered or system is perfectly ordered if i told you this so i don't even have to talk about this i can just tell you that the system is perfectly ordered and i tell you that spin of a is equal to plus one then you can immediately say that with a very, very high likelihood, the spin of B must also be plus one, right? You don't have to go there and measure it. You can just say it from here. I know what's going on all the way out there. So in a perfect system, that would be true. In an imperfect system, what will happen or in any real world system, what will happen that you won't be able to make a system where correlations exist over such a perfect length, right? 
I can give you an example. If you're doing any sort of material science, you're designing a battery or something, you'll have grain boundaries that show up, right? And correlation will be lost across the grain boundary. So in any practical system, there is a distance over which fluctuations in one region of space are correlated with each other. So in this region, all fluctuations are correlated with each other. If you go too far out, the correlations, they are no longer correlated with each other. So this is our range of correlation. So, so. Before we go further, I have a question going two slides back. Uh, with the plot of A tilde. Mm -hmm. kind of, so what determines say, like the, kind of the width of this barrier between the two wells? Width meaning this the thing or full? Right, kind of like the, you know, like the full, uh, full width to half maximum, whatever. Oh, full width at half maximum? <laughs> kind of characteristic width of that middle barrier. You can calculate it. That's, you, you need to calculate the second moment and third moment of the given probability function. I'm sorry, you cut out? What, what? You can calculate it given the probability function that you have. Okay. You can calculate it. I mean, it's a, you should do it and submit it to me, what you find. Huh. Cause I was just thinking, you know, like maybe you could, like if you could make it thin enough, could you get, I don't know, I guess this isn't really quantum, but some kind of tunneling effect. Oh yeah, you could get all sorts of things. So people apply these models to um, lots of quantum models. I uh, uh, invite you to go and read up things such as the Kitev model, which applies to uh, uh, the topological insulators and things like that. It all builds up on this simple model. And there, instead of, the thing that will happen there is that instead of counting the total number of spins, you will introduce your favorite C dagger multiplied by C, annihilation operators and things like that. And suddenly you are in a quantum world and all these questions can be asked in quantum world also. So you, if, if you're taking quantum mechanics, you would recognize what these things are. So it, it applies directly to quantum problems and you should go and read, I can send you papers if you want. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. So. So this is a simple idea. All we are saying is that range of correlation is the distance over which fluctuations in one region of space are correlated or affected by those in another region. So, and now you can see that if the system had a good, had a net magnetization, if the system had a finite average magnetization, it must mean that the correlation length is actually very high, right? If the correlation length of the system is very small and you no longer have that spins in this region have nothing to do with spins in this region, for example, just because you observe this to be positive, you can say nothing about the spins over here. If correlation length is small, we will not have finite average magnetization. It will just die out. System is not correlated. There is no idea. There is no, there is no probability. You, you might say, well, how do you know there is no, no probability doesn't mean it still can't be the same magnetization, but no, I'm saying that it cannot be. And we will, we will go through the proof. We'll not have finite average magnetization. If correlation length is small, we will not have a finite average magnetization. In other words, finite average magnetization, or more generally speaking, finite value of any order parameter is synonymous with the existence of long range order. So, <clears throat> We can quantify this and I'm gonna stop soon and move over to your presentations uh, as many as we can do today. So we can, we can quantify this by looking at the pair correlation. And it's a good idea to do this this time so it will be a bit familiar next time when we start. Pair correlation function between spins i and j. So this pair correlation function is defined as cij and it is given as the average value of SI multiplied by SJ minus average of SI 
multiplied by average of fj. So if i and j were independent, what does that mean? So for example, if i came from here and j came from somewhere very out, much longer than correlation length, then si sj would be equal to si multiplied by sj. This is the definition of independence. Two things being independent is when their joint is separate from the product of the individual values or cij would be equal to zero. So in other words, so cij is equal to zero is when spin at site i is uncorrelated with spin at site j. This allows us to prove something quite nice, which is if you sum up, if you go to any one side, so I can, I can take any value over here, right? It could be one, two, three, four, j can also take any value, one, two, three, four, whatever you want. It can't really be the same thing. You can't talk about the correlation of a site with itself. Of course, that is perfectly correlated. That much doesn't make sense. So let's think about the correlation of site one with some other site j, and let's sum up j from two to n, whatever we have. This is going to be the number of spins, and I put an approximate sign, number of spins correlated with spin one. This is a problem on the fifth homework. You can see why it might be true, because if all spins were uncorrelated, then Cij would be zero for all spins and the number of spins would be zero. So it's clearly true for that. But for higher case, you have to deal with a bit of probability. What I'm going to show you next class is something which I like a lot, which is this. So next class, we will talk about, let's see if I get the spelling right, susceptibility. And we will show that how susceptibility is the same thing pretty much as the existence of long range order. So susceptibility is a term that you might have come across when you did magnetic fields and stuff in electromagnetism in high school or your first year undergrad or something like that. It's also a word that you come across in, in society, right? You say a certain something is susceptible to something else, right? So it's, it's susceptibility is the propensity for change. So it kind of shows you how stubborn a system is. So, and we will, we will look at all these things carefully and uh, we will show that we will derive that susceptibility chi, which is in general for magnetization defined as one over n, how does the average magnetization change with the strength of the applied external field at a constant temperature? This is the definition of how does the magnetization change with the strength of the external field that you have applied? So if something is very strongly susceptible, if the susceptibility is high, it means that as soon as you change the external magnetic field H slightly, the net magnetization booms up, it rises very quickly. So that's a very high susceptibility system. We will show that chi can, is actually the same as mu square j is equal to two, in this case, it's actually j is equal to one to n C1j. We will derive this the next time. Okay, good. So now let's go to our presentations. Who wants to go first? Raise your hand, like Zoom allows you to raise your hand. Or I will pick randomly, you know. Firm believer in randomness. I'll go first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So let's, so what I'm going to do is to share my screen and this is why I uh, started doing it from my computer and I don't want us flipping back and forth because it will just take time. Do you all see my screen? Do you see my folder? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So. I don't know if you all realize this. So you all use Google Drive, but let me tell you something that I'm quite proud of, uh, of discovering, this thing called Google File Stream. Google File Stream is a professional version of Google Drive, which UMD pays for, and there you get unlimited storage. 
So, and it is so wonderful that now my desktop is basically empty. I have nothing, everything is on cloud. You can install it over here and it's super nice because anytime, for example, when you uploaded your answers, I didn't have to go and download it. It just showed up in my Google Drive folder and it's super convenient. So let's go to this, to responses. This is, um, Okay, so everyone else just stay mute and then. Okay, we should have a better way of finding it. That's Sai, Becca, Emily, Thomas. Where are you, Ben? Uh, on yeah, I found it. Okay, so you will do the old school style next slide and I will walk you through and uh, you will not be, you will be muted at four minutes. Wait, so, uh, wait. Let's, I will tell you when your time starts. Okay, your time starts now. Okay, so let me tell you all about the Weeks Chandler Anderson theorem theory and the Van der Waals picture for condensed systems. Uh, next slide. Ooh. All right. Ooh. Okay, so uh, the basic idea is that um, that the short range strongly repulsive interactions between particles in the system is the, uh, the, the most important determinant of the structure and properties of the system. Uh, a why and the point is a, a wide range of actual liquids and even some solids can be accurately modeled using the appropriate Van der Waals uh, particles. And so you can see here on the, the plot from the, the paper, you can see a, uh, particles, you know, closely packed. And you can look at the G of R. And so the solid line, which is the G of R only with repulsive interactions, matches up really well with the dots, which is for uh, the full inner particle potential. Next slide. So building on this picture of um, you know, strongly repulsive interactions and then weaker long range interactions, so the, the WCA, the Weeks Chandler Anderson theory, kind of uh, the approach is to take the pair potential between particles and separate it into only a harshly repulsive short range potential, which you see on the, the far right over there, and then a, um, a slowly varying long range attractive potential, or even maybe long range repulsive, but it's slowly varying. And if you, you approximate the G of R with only the repulsive potential, it turns out to be really great. And the long range um, interactions provide just a mean field, like, like a cohesive binding energy for the system for a given density and pressure. And, and then is, that's treated as a perturbation using that first order perturbation theory. You use the strictly repulsive as your reference system, and then you can use the long range interaction and the uh, the G of R with the repulse for the repulsive system to you know, do the the thing we've been talking about calculate thermodynamic properties. Uh, next, yeah, and so here's just a visual aid, uh, kind of based on a passage in the paper where they literally describe. So you take benzene liquid, for example, and you think of it as like a bowl of Cheerios. And then you could maybe have benzene and argon in solution and put blueberries in the Cheerio. And that's, then you have a picture of kind of the structure of these liquids and even solids like glasses, maybe they're anything that's really has really a, has to have a high density. And so it suppresses long wavelength fluctuation because all of that um, particles and molecules are closely packed together. And uh, I think that's about it. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Ben. Who wants to go next? I'll go. Okay, uh, is that Logan? Yes. Okay, Logan is going to tell us about drug design. Yep. Great. Okay, Logan, do you see your own slide? Yes. Perfect. Please start. Your time starts now. Okay. Um, so I looked at the paper that was on the free energy uh, methods, which is the alchemical perturbation. Um, next slide, yeah. So um, the free energy of binding uh, can be used to understand the importance of the individual interactions between a ligand and its target, typically a protein. Um, in order to calculate this free energy of binding, you have to have the um, structure and the energies of like the target protein, the ligand, and the solvent. Uh, and you also need the total number of energies and the free states um, and the total number and energies of the bound states so that you can end up using um, a partition function like we've talked about in class. So there are a couple different ways that they went about calculating this uh, free energy. So they started by using molecular dynamic simulations. Um, so what they did is they're able to measure uh, the force of attraction between the ligand and the protein as the ligand is slowly pulled out of the binding site. Um, and this gives the potential of mean force like we talked about in class. Um, so for the steered, mole steered molecular dynamics, um, the force is applied to pull the ligand out of the binding site, uh, but this uses uh, non-equilibrium uh, measurements. And then uh, the umbrella sampling uses a series of equilibrium simulations um, with incremental changes to the ligand position, uh, pulling it away from the binding site and then reassembles all the data so that you get this potential of mean force for the binding uh, reaction. And then there's two methods of these alchemical transformations, uh, or also known as the free energy perturbation calculations. Um, so there's the non-physical transformation, where one compound is transformed into a, a related compound, and then they calculate the difference uh, in the interaction uh, free energy between the solvent and uh, the protein of the two. Um, and then the other method converts the compound into, oh, go back, go back. Yeah, uh, converts the compound into dummy atoms um, and then calculates the free energy difference between uh, an interacting molecule and a molecule in a vacuum. And then the last approach is the calculation. Uh, so they have two ways of calculating uh, this free energy. So you have an absolute approach uh, so that determines the change in free energy of moving the ligand from the solution uh, to the ground state uh, by decoupling the bound ligand from the binding site. And then the uh, relative approach calculates the difference in free energy of the binding of a pair of ligands. Um, so you have one in solution and one in the binding site and you essentially transform one into the other and calculate that energy change. Next slide, please. Um, so there are a couple advantages and different and disadvantages to um, going about calculating binding energy this way. Um, for in terms of advantages, uh, these calculations closely resemble experimental results, um, and they're more accurate than other methods such as like endpoint approximation methods. Um, and these calculations also have been able to um, assist in establishing uh, more accurate drug design parameters. So if you kind of know what you should be looking for for these individual interactions. Uh, but as for disadvantages, um, there's a, it has a harder time uh, with novel small molecules because you have to have the right parameterization. Um, and while the results do resemble experimental results, uh, there are varying degrees of accuracy depending on which method is chosen. Um, and currently, these calculations are all carried out retrospectively. Um, so you, they kind of go off the x-ray crystallography data versus something that's kind of de novo. Uh, last slide, please. One more. There you go. Um, and then, so there's a couple of limitations, um, including, you know, the quality of the input parameters are really important, um, how they decide to treat the electrostatics, um, and the method of sampling is really important. And then also there can be intrinsic errors in the model. So if there's a problem with uh, the foundation, that's a, that could end up uh, changing your results. And then there's also time constraints because these are very uh, large data sets to sample. Um, so that can be a huge problem as well. So. I'm out. Okay, great. Thanks, Logan. Who Thank wants you. to go next? I can go next. Is that Paul? Yeah. Uh, you, you're here. Okay, with the same paper, that's good. And that's 
to full screen mode. Okay, your time starts now. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll kind of build off the stuff that Logan was talking about. So uh, the big thing that this paper looks at is protein ligand thermodynamics. Um, so the big question when you're talking about protein ligand thermodynamics is getting the delta G value for binding of the ligand. So this is useful for drug design because a lot of drugs work by binding to a protein. Um, and the delta G can show how tightly the protein binds or the, the ligand, the drug binds to the protein, and it's useful for just understanding biochemical systems in general with naturally occurring ligands. So next slide. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I decided to focus on the perturbation side of this. So this was the alchemical transformation uh, stuff that Logan was talking about. So here's two figures from the uh, paper. So in the first, uh, as Logan talk, talked about, is the transformation of one molecule into another. Um, so here we're converting ethane to methanol. And then in the second, which is the lower one, we're transforming ethane into just nothing. So it would be just like surround, the surrounding environment. So if we apply these perturbations uh, gradually, we should be able to use Zwanzig's perturbation theory, uh, which can help us describe uh, the system. So an important thing I wanted to draw attention to, oh, actually, yeah. So an important thing I wanted to draw attention to, uh, or wait, no, go back to the previous one. Yeah, is the lambda values underneath each of the images. So lambda is kind of like this parameter that measures how much of the transformation has happened so far. Uh, so in lambda equals zero, that corresponds to the initial thing, and then lambda equals one corresponds to the ending state. So the paper doesn't talk too much about um, exactly how this lambda is varied and how many transitions are needed, but I saw in a separate paper, uh, they tried to do the bottom uh, transformation, or no, sorry, the top one, to get the uh, solvation energy of ethane versus methanol, so the difference in the, the delta G values. Um, and when they used four transformations or four different values of lambda, um, the, the results were very, very different from the experimental values. But then when they used 16 transformations, so 16 intermediate lambda values, um, th then they finally got uh, good agreement. So these lambda values, they, they, they might require uh, many, many small step sizes in order to get good results. And um, yeah, so now the next one. So they talk about two different things. Logan also talked about this, the absolute free energy perturbation, which it corresponds to the second image from the previous slide, where you have the ligand, and then you compare it to uh, a version of the ligand that doesn't interact with the solvent or the protein at all. Um, and so, oh, and then you also have the relative free energy perturbation, which compares two different ligands and their relative free energies. And they, they call this the delta delta G, which is a pretty good name. Um, and here, the delta G formulas rely on uh, the fact that a complete cycle around this system should sum to zero, um, and then they flip some of the signs to make things more intuitive. So yeah, next slide. So uh, an important thing that we talked about in class, so that exponential term in Zwanzig's relation uh, has to be, uh, well, the perturbation term, want, you want it to stay small, because if the perturbation term becomes too large, then that exponential term becomes very, very small, because the exponent is negative beta e. Right, so uh, in between each, uh, in each perturbation, you want to keep the the changes very very small. So that's why the lambda value uh, has to be uh, increased very very minimally each uh, during each iteration. And then if you want to compare two very very different ligands, like they did in the paper uh, with tolcapone and opicapone, you might have to have many many of these uh, lambda transitions before uh, you can actually safely use perturbation theory. Um, so then last slide. Uh, yeah, so here, uh, I didn't talk too much about this, but the idea is to get the initial sampling, you need to employ some sort of um, subsampling method. And in the paper, they talk about steered and umbrella sampling. Yeah. OK, uh, Okay. thanks, Paul. Who wants to go next? I'll go next. Is that Suhas? Yes, Suhas. OK, Suhas, one or two? They're the same. So. One, 139 a.m. or 134 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Let's go with one. Yeah. Okay. Let's do you full screen. Okay. So, as your time starts. All right. So, I'm talking about the same paper, but I'm trying to, uh, uh, I focus on trying to illustrate one of the case studies that they provide. So, next slide, please. Okay. So, um, so the, the problem that they talk about in this paper is that you have this protein, uh, which is binding a ligand 
And when it binds the ligand, there's a disease, there's a disease response. And um, the goal of drug design is to try to find, usually the goal of drug design is to find a ligand that can compete with the cat ligand that I'm showing on the left and uh, try to block the, inhib uh, block the protein and um, try to suppress the disease response. So let's say you, you want some inhibitors and you put out an ad and then in the first stage you've screened them. So you've screened out all your uh, sort of candidate ligands and you've come up with a set, a short list of ligands that you think will work. So uh, ideally, you could test all of them on a simulator and then you can test all of them on site and see how well they work. Uh, but testing on site is very expensive because uh, that is basically a clinical trial or a lot of lab testing, uh, cell testing and everything. So it is, a, it's very difficult to test uh, every compound in your shortlist. So uh, next slide, please. So that, um, that uh, makes it important to be able to test them on a simulator first. So um, in this paper, they talk about alchemical free energy perturbations as a way to screen these molecules better and try to find uh, the, like, the best few molecules from your short list. Uh, next slide. So how do, we about go, how do they go about doing it? It's, um, so they make incremental transformations to ligands and they rank them based on how, uh, based on the favorability of their binding. So if, um, if some ligand is uh, very favorable, then uh, compared to the others, then that is taken, uh, you know, um, carried forward into further testing uh, as a drug. So uh, you basically go, you can go through these perturbation cycles. So I'm focusing on relative free energy perturbations. Uh, uh, you can go through these um, thermodynamic cycles where you start off with the scat and you uh, find the delta G of uh, unbinding of the cat and then you can alchemically transform it by adding the sunglasses group, right? And then you can also um, find the uh, delta G of binding for the, the, the cat with sunglasses, the cool cat. And based on those two calculations, you can find the difference in their binding free energies. So you can try to get an estimate of which uh, ligand binds more easily. Uh, and then you can come up with a rank. Yes. Uh, yeah, last slide. Um, um, yeah, so this is the sort of same paper that Pavan was talking about. So basically what they found is they start off with this catechol ligand, uh, which binds this protein and it causes a disease. And they try to like um, add different groups to it. And they found that um, the, the, the ligand with the sunglasses, the opicapone, uh, uh, was, much, was a much stronger binder than the cat with the sort of hat. Um, and the conclusion is that these methods can be fruitfully applied in rational drug design. That's it. Okay, thanks, Sohas. Who wants to go next? I can give it a shot. Okay, that's Kevin. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, one moment. Let's do view. Let's do the command. Oh, that didn't work. That worked. Okay, your time starts now. Okay. Uh, I also, uh, like Ben, did the uh, Van der Waals picture uh, by Chandler, Weeks, and Anderson. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so the paper essentially starts with a really quick review of just what the Van der Waals model is. Essentially, you have, there's a bunch of different types of interactions that we call Van der Waals interactions. There's these hard sphere type interactions that are due to Pauli exclusion principle that the atoms actually don't want to overlap, so they would bump into each other. Uh, then there's also things such as uh, induced dipoles and other things that can can affect that all of them together are just called van der Waals forces. Uh, but in the hard sphere approach to that, you just take into account the Pauli uh, exclusion principle force that these things can be modeled as basically little billiard balls, almost. And you, uh, what the paper argues is that you can pretty much neglect all of those uh, attractive forces from all of those other types of van der Waals forces uh, by taking a mean field approach where you essentially say that if the fluid that you're looking at is dense enough, uh, the, 
total attractive forces around any particle exert a net vector force of zero and you can't reshuffle things enough. You can't get density fluctuations that are large enough to give you any sort of net vector force on any given particle that you look at. And thus you can just treat all of these attractive forces as being a background mean field that is nothing. Uh, we'll go to the next one, next slide. Uh, so they then go on to uh, actually check this against um, different G of R's for the Leonard Jones potential. Uh, I actually made this and it was really hard. Um, so finding this for even the Leonard Jones potential is very difficult. Um, but as you can see, if you plot G of R, the blue, uh, for just the total Leonard Jones potential, and then you plot it for just the attractive portion of the Leonard Jones potential, it looks nearly identical, just as in the paper. And then if you plot it for the hard sphere potential, as you go out in our, uh, in your, your distance, these fluctuate, these, these wave patterns around the density really tamper out. And so you can, what they argue is that you can essentially approximate uh, even something, uh, so the, the van der Waals forces in, a, in a, a real fluid by just a hard sphere model with a, with a correct uh, sphere diameter uh, that goes past all of these small oscillations. And if you go to the next slide, uh, what they then finally go on to say is, uh, well, they basically, so now they've argued that this should be a valid way of doing things uh, approximately. And so what they then do is they use something called WCA theory, which is a basically a way of quantifying the difference between the two pictures, the hard sphere model and the just attractive portion of the Vander, of the uh, Leonard Jones potential. And it gives you a, a way of calculating a diameter for your hard spheres that will be optimal. And once you do that, they then just use thermodynamic perturbation theory uh, in a similar way that we used it, expanding in powers of uh, G of R for calculating for your thermodynamics. And they find that if you only go to the first order, it's pretty much identical to the hard sphere potential. So the final conclusion then coming from that is if you have a fluid that is not compressed, but dense enough that this mean field approach seems to be valid for it, and you, your thermodynamics is not really affected as much by higher order terms for this fluid, which is a lot of real fluids, you can safely approximate things with just a, a hard sphere model which is a, a, an extremely good result because as I can tell you for the, uh, even just the Leonard Jones potential calculating for G of R is, uh, it can get really hard really quickly. And so if you can use this approximation uh, in a wide range of applications, it's actually extremely, extremely useful. And that's it. Okay, thanks Kevin. So, yeah, so just to give you, all these papers are very interesting, you know, did this WCA, the science, this was a paper in science, the one you guys are reviewing, but before that, eight years before that, there was a paper in Journal of Chemical Physics, which is called as the WCA paper. And if you go and look up Scholar Google, that paper has something like, I don't know, 5,000 citations or something. And if you go off John Weeks, how easy it was to publish that paper, they had to fight the reviewer for more than a year. It was a bitter, bitter experience. Just shows you because all of you will be publishing papers soon enough if you're not already doing that. Sometimes the reviewers can be, well, assholes. Don't let it get to you. You should believe in your science. Who wants to go next? I can go next. Who's that? That's I Raquel. Okay. okay, now we are gonna learn about machine learning. Okay, your time starts. Okay, so I am Hakel. I'm gonna talk about how, how does physics connect with machine learning blog post review. Next. Next. Okay. okay, so the main idea of the blog post is to talk about things that are totally from physics and things that are totally from machine learning and how they can be mapped into one another. So how they can be related. If we look at the next. Why this article? Okay, so first, why this article? It's been some time, you can go back. Why this article? So it's been some time since I wanted to learn about machine learning. It's something that is a cool thing that everybody's talking about, but I had no idea about anything about machine learning. So I wanted to know something and since there was this opportunity, so I took this article as a chance to learn something about machine learning. Next. 
In the physics part, they talk about Ising model, variation method. They talk about the mean field approximation. A lot of things that we learn in class and it's a really good reading because it's in a very accessible language. So I recommend it, very good. In the machine learning part, they talk about variation and inference and base rule. There are some um, basic and principal concepts in machine learning to understand how it works. Next. So just to talk first about machine learning because the other parts we learned in class, they show us this base rule. And at first, when I saw that, I was very confused. I saw posterior probability, prior probability, likelihood. I was very confused. I couldn't understand anything. But then I could understand by looking at a simple example. And next. So for example, if we think about, uh, we have some data. So we have some data and we can make a guess. We can say like, I think the distribution of my data is gonna be linear. So it's gonna be this red thing. Now I can see how my, my data is gonna fit with this distribution. And this is gonna be the blue thing. Now that we know that using the base rule, we can find the posterior probability, which is the probability after seeing the data, which is this green thing. And this posterior probability is gonna be closer to the actual distribution of my data. And the good thing is that we can learn from that and do another step, so next. Now we can use this posterior probability as our prior probability. So this is our new guess. And then now we can again see how our data reacts to that and calculate a new posterior probability. So eventually we're gonna get even closer to the actual distribution of our data. So that's the, for me, was a spectacular to see how this works in machine learning. Next. So, but now uh, going to the main of the of the blog that will see how physics connects with machine learning they walks through a path where they explain to us this gibbs bogov Feynman inequality where we can find a lower limit a lower bound to the actual partition function that is difficult to calculate using mu fi, mean, mean field approximation so this is the inequality they show us next from machine learning using a totally different set, setup we can use variation inference to get a different inequality, but they get kind of the same idea. They look similar at first, but they are different. We have this P, which is the, the denominator in the base rule, it's a normalization factor, and this Q, which is a distribution that we can just uh, choose a simple distribution in order to approximate the actual Z that we want to calculate. The actual P that we want to calculate. So this is from different place and we choose the Q in order to approximate the normalization factor that it's hard to calculate. Next. But now well, as we look at these two things at the same time, we can see that they actually kind of are the same thing. So P of X is a normalization factor just like partition function. So it could be the same thing. This P of X, Y is just like the summation of over exponential of minus beta E. So it would be the beta E. And the Q, which is something that we can choose to be simpler, could be the, the distribution with the mean field approximation. So the two things are really related and they are really kind of the same thing, but just come from two different approaches to different places. So that's all, I, I got my time. And uh, I really like the, the paper, that's all, thank you. Okay, thanks, Raquel. That was very nice. And uh, who wants to go next? Shokan? Okay, oh, yes. you're talking about the same topic. It's, it's good mm -hmm. that you guys are all uh, clustered in that manner so you can build up a little bit. Okay, so let's do command L and... Okay, your time starts now. Okay, I'm going to talk about the connection between physics and machine learning. So. Uh, we start from doing the IC model analyzed by mean field theory, and we already learned the result, uh, which is delta H should be equal to ZJM. Uh, however, this is an approximation, and we want to know if delta H can be maybe larger or smaller to optimize our approximation mean field. So how to do that, we want to verify uh, so we will use the perturbation theory, which is a physical way, and the variational interference and the posterior interference, which are machine learning ways. Next page. Okay, so first from perturbation theory, 
uh, we already learned the Zwanzig's equation and we will use the <coughs> Taylor expansion. And then we will use the, uh, I will say that GBF inequality and we will get the very important uh, inequality equation uh, formula here, which is circle. And uh, this means we will get a lower bound for Z and we need to maximize the lower bound to optimize our approximation. Mm. And uh, how to do that, we will take the derivative and uh, after calculation, we will find that delta H equal to JDM is, is actually the optimum uh, result. Next page. And then we will use machine learning ways, which is variational interference. Inference. Uh, we will construct a simpler probability distribution Q to approximate the original probability distribution P. And we will use the KL divergence, uh, which is uh, uh, a uh, uh, an index of the information loss uh, in our approximation. So uh, the lower the information loss uh, means the better our approximation is. And we will assume the QS to have a mean field theory form, which is the product of each uh, individual's means. And we will finally get, uh, after some calculations, we will finally get this uh, inequality again, which is the same as uh, which we see before. And next page. Uh, so we will again use the posterior interference. And according to the Bayes rule, we have this equation. Uh, and maximizing this PZX means to maximize the probability to find our model PZ fit the observed data X. Uh, so we will have a data X and we will um, have a PZ and we change the parameters again and again to optimize the observed data. And we will see what's the result uh, is again this um, inequality, BGF inequality again. And, and next page. So we show that for the icing model, the okay, GBF inequality have the same function as the KL divergence and the Bayes rule. Uh, we, we proved that there are interconnections between physics and machine learning because they share the common interest in dealing with big data and approximation. We will expect the cross-section communication to accelerate the development in both fields. Okay. Okay, thanks, uh, Shokong. And one thing I want to point is this inequality over here, the average of e to the power f more than equal to e to the power average of f, you should all look up, especially if you like math. It's related to uh, something called Jensen inequality, which is essentially the statement of the same thing. No, it happens in science many times. We discover a formula and either someone else had discovered it or it was known in some other form of science in a different way. So what you're seeing here is the name is basically statement of this Jensen inequality. Okay, great. So three, seven people have done today. I don't want to push it too much. It's 12.15. Next time we will again do with uh, seven people. I was very happy to see your, uh, all of your presentation was really nice. Thank you very, very much for doing it. And uh, next time we will go through remaining and we will talk, continue to talk about uh, correlation length and then gradually move into renormation group. We have enough time, so there is no rush. Again, we will do six, seven, and maybe we will do, if, if we don't have enough time, we will do it in another class. And for the final also, I am going to uh, give you a similar choice of papers. There will be a bit of a difference. You will have two papers and uh, you will have to pick one from each group. You will submit two reports. And for reports, some of you ask me, well, my report is more than two pages. What should I do? Well, I'm not going to grade your report if it's more than two pages. I'm not going to be harsh also, so it's okay. But this is something you will experience in your professional careers later. I, it happens to me in grant proposals and everything. They want a one-page report. They want a two-page report. If you can't submit longer than that, they will not read it. So it's a good discipline to have that. It also reminds me when I was an undergrad, I would always worry, how do I write a CV or a resume in one page? I have so many things to talk about. 
And now most of the resumes that I submit for this or that is typically one to two pages. So learn to be brief. In that spirit, I will stop the class for today and see you next time.